ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it is a great honor to address this distinguished AAAS gathering on building the Global Knowledge Society, a topic very close to my heart, as I have been privileged in building an institution that aspires to be one of the participants in this Global Knowledge Society, the new Library of Alexandria in Egypt, the Bibliotheca Alexandrina, that famous ancient library reborn in the digital age at the same location where it disappeared some 1600 years ago. I deeply regret that I'm not with you in person today. The revolution in our country has unleashed enormous forces, mostly exalting and inspiring and some vicious and destructive as when the Institut d'Egypte, our Academy of Sciences that was established in 1798, was burned to the ground and its books and manuscripts and records destroyed. But happily, despite wild moments and difficult episodes, thanks to the efforts of our staff, the new Library of Alexandria is back in operation as we limit the wild urges of the few and call to the better angels of the many. I will have more to say on this in a moment. Allow me today to cover three broad topics in these remarks. First, my belief that a real global knowledge revolution is underway. It will be the most sweeping since the invention of writing. It has, as far as I can see, seven pillars, and its impact will create a new world full of promise, full of challenges. Second, what are we doing in the Library of Alexandria to confront these challenges? Third, in the revolutionary turmoil of our country, what will become of this reborn Bibliotheca Alexandrina? Will it survive? And finally, to conclude, I will return to the idea of the values of science and how essential they are to fulfill the promise of the Global Knowledge Society that we seek to build. So, without further ado, allow me to turn to my first theme and to sketch out this profound knowledge revolution we are going through. Humanity is hurtling into an amazing future of knowledge and communication, driven by an amazing explosion of science and technology. So please join me in this journey of exploration into the shape of tomorrow, a world where access to knowledge is a fundamental right and the sharing of knowledge is a fundamental duty, to quote Lydia Brito of Mozambique. I invite you to share my wonder and admiration, my concerns and my misgivings, and above all, to be infected by the excitement of the times and the fantastic explorations that lie ahead, that will transform forever our views of ourselves and of the universe that surrounds us, that will change the very structure of knowledge that we delve into, manipulate and add to in the hope of creating better tomorrows. So let us look into the seven pillars of the knowledge revolution. The first of these seven pillars is parsing and the life and the organization of knowledge. Since the beginning of time, whether we were writing on scrolls or on codexes, whether the codexes were printed or, or manuscripts, the accumulation of knowledge was based on parsed structures with units put next to each other like bricks in a wall of an emerging structure. It was the juxtaposition of these individual past works that created the accumulation of knowledge. The rising edifice built piece by piece, brick by brick, or stone by stone. In addition, each piece was dead. By that I mean that once published, it stayed as it was until a second edition would appear. If we both had copies of the same book, we could both open to, say, page 157 and find exactly the same thing in our respective copies. It did not change whether we did it immediately after the book appeared or decades later. But the internet changed all that. The web page became the unit of 
parsing. Instead of the classical sequence of presentation, we now think in terms of a home page and then hypertext links into other related documents. We can expect more fluidity into the merging of image, both still and video, and the transitions from one reference link to another. And search engines complement the World Wide Web as the online material, unlike the traditionally published material, becomes alive. So today, if I look up a web page and you look it up at the same location a few hours later, it will probably have changed since the material is constantly being updated. Furthermore, as we move beyond the current structures of the web towards the semantic web, where we can search for relationships and concepts and not just objects, the structure of organization and presentation of knowledge will become one large, interconnected, vibrant, living tissue of concepts, ideas, and facts that is growing exponentially and which will require new modes of thinking to interact with it. It will automatically spawn these new modes of thinking and scholarship will be no longer parsed like bricks in a wall. It will be more like a smooth, fluid, flowing river. Now, if one were to try to take into account as well the emergence of the social linkages phenomena that the Internet and the web have now made possible, we can now visualize what some specialists, such as Nova Spivak, have called the MetaWeb, with high knowledge connectivity and high social connectivity. Does that MetaWeb prefigure the connectivity of intelligence? Who knows? The second pillar is image and text. Throughout history, the primary means for the transmission of information has been text. Images were difficult to produce and to reproduce. This has changed. With the digital revolution, everybody can record images, both still and video, and computer-generated graphics are becoming affordable by everybody. Again, what does that mean in terms of the presentation, the search and the retrieval functions, and the interaction between the researcher and the material in the future? And that brings me to the third pillar, the relationship between humans and machines. With the exception of pure mathematics and some aspects of philosophy, it will no longer be possible for any human to search for, find, and retrieve, and then manipulate knowledge in any field much less add to it and communicate their own contribution to others without the intermediation of machines. This is not good or bad, it just is. Now, after a special chess playing program called Big Blue of IBM defeated world champion Garry Kasparov in chess in 1997, can we indeed ask, as some visionaries are doing, whether consciousness and intelligence are emanating qualities from very complex systems. But whatever the merits of that particular debate and its ramifications, it is clear that changes are already noticeable in the domain of libraries and the Internet. And one example of that is the new World Digital Library, launched by the Library of Congress with the support of the Library of Alexandria and many others, which allows us to link video, image, text, and commentary, and maps into one seamless whole and to be able to search for many different approaches such as time, geography, theme, cluster, or even a single word. And browse through the material from India, United States, Egypt, Russia, all of them together offer from all countries coming together in this world digital library, prefiguring the future. Fourth is complexity and chaos. The world we live in is remarkably complex. The socio-economic transactions of a globalizing world are exceedingly intricate. As with the click of a mouse and the flight of an electron, billions of dollars move around the planet at the speed of light. The web of interconnected transactions is enormous. And the ripple effects of any single set of actions and its interaction with other effects is difficult to predict. Our cities have become not only much larger, but also much more complex. 
And ecosystems are not only delicate, they are intrinsically very complex. So are biological systems. You will need a new mathematics. Fifth, computation and research. Till now, computing has been largely seen as the extension of a large calculating machine that can do dumb calculations at incredible speeds. Wonderful tools, no doubt, but just tools all the same. But today, the concepts and the techniques of computing and computer science will become a central part of the new research paradigm. Computational science concepts and tools and theorems will weave into the very fabric of science and scientific practice. But beyond the scale and magnitude of the collections of data, we are looking for connections between collections of data. And these pose particular problems that involve qualitatively different issues. Now, computer science is where the most work on such classes of problems has been done. My sixth pillar is convergence and transformation. Domains are gradually converging. In simplest terms, once upon a time, we had chemistry and biology as distinct and separate enterprises, and now we have biochemistry. Now, such moments of convergence, generating new sciences and insights, turned out to be some of the most fecund moments in the evolution of our knowledge and the development of our technologies. And today, we are witnessing the convergence of three hitherto separate fields with the birth of bio-info nanotechnology. Now, will such developments remain serendipitous or will our research paradigms systematically force the development of such converging domains and transformative insights? I believe we are poised to do the latter. Seventh and last pillar is pluridisciplinarity and policy. There is a real value in crossing disciplines. Well grounded in one discipline, we should be open to others. Increasingly, both in academic organization and in tackling real life problems, we note that the old silos of disciplines by themselves are not productive enough. Much of the most interesting work is being done in between the disciplines, where they intersect or where the gaps are. And increasingly, we recognize that our real life problems, such as poverty, gender, or the environment, are all multidimensional and complex and require a special way of organizing all the various disciplinary inputs. So just as we say that uh, diversity is enriching, so is the sharing of knowledge across disciplines. Seven pillars sketch out the contours of a revolution that will undergird that new global knowledge society we seek to build. Will that new world allow us to go to better and wiser lives for all? Now remember that data when organized becomes information, which when explained becomes knowledge. But to confront the challenges of the 21st century, we will need more than knowledge. We will need wisdom. For wisdom is more than knowledge. It implies understanding and judgment, combining the insights of knowledge with the patina of experience. Maybe that new global reality will take us there. But humility would have us ask, as T.S. Eliot did a century ago, where is the life we have lost in living? Where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge we have lost in information? But wise or not, humanity is hurtling towards that future at great speed. And undoubtedly, the implications of these seven pillars of the knowledge revolution pose challenges to the institutions of knowledge in our societies, our educational and research facilities, as well as the institutions supporting our knowledge, libraries, archives, and museums. So let us now turn to my second theme and look into the case of the new Library of Alexandria and how it 
tried to rise to that challenge. 2,300 years ago, Alexander the Great selected the site for his new capital, Alexandria. It was built by the Ptolemies, its lighthouse dazzled the world, and the ancient library of Alexandria nurtured the greatest adventure of the human intellect. Part academy, part research center, and part library, it welcomed the great thinkers of the age. Scientists, mathematicians, and poets from all civilizations came to study and exchange ideas. Universal knowledge was organized. Unbounded inquiry was encouraged. And intercultural dialogue was nurtured. The library completely disappeared over 1,600 years ago, but it continued to inspire scientists and scholars everywhere. And a few years ago, the fabled Bibliotheca Alexandrina was reborn, the new library of Alexandria. Like its illustrious predecessor, it is dedicated to advancing universal knowledge, not a single specialty. It is addressing research and applying advanced techniques to everything from the visual arts to informatics, from documentation of heritage to the promotion of peace. It is a university without walls or registration, without formal certificates or structured courses. It is open to all those who seek knowledge in all its aspects and manifestations, all those who love art in all its wondrous expressions, all those who thirst after a better understanding of their heritage and of the world, all those who dream of pushing the frontiers of scientific knowledge to wherever human ingenuity will take. <laughs> The reborn Biblioteca Alexandrina in the era of the digital world. What is it? Well, first, like its ancient namesake, it is not a library in the sense of a repository of books. It is many things. It's a landmark building. It's a hive of activities. It has multiple institutions within it. It has many libraries many museums and galleries and research institutes all in one big complex that we call the Biblioteca Alexandrina or the new Library of Alexandria. It is a spectacular building. It has won many awards and still takes your breath away from the beauty of the building and the design. It is a large building like a saw disc slightly rising to face the sea with a small uh, satellite, which is the planetarium, and an old conference center attached to it. And the whole complex is connected underground. And right next to it is the campus of the University of Alexandria. And in those two streets there, many demonstrations were to come. That will be something we will come back to. This is the large reading room, one of the most beautiful places in the world. Spectacular, dramatic architecture. Our conference center of the highest facilities. But it's not the building that counts, it's the hive of activities inside. We received 1.4 million visitors and we expect to receive more in the future. We try to cater specifically to children everywhere. We had over 600,000 reader visits at last year. And our websites receive over 600 million hits per year on our websites. Most come from Egypt, followed by the United States, followed by many other countries. We hold many events, both inside and outside the building. And we held over 730 this last year. 
And that's not counting the educational course meetings and the art school meetings that take place. But do include the concerts, the ballets, the annual book fairs and such events. The library has multiple institutions dedicated to learning, rationality, communication and dialogue. We're committed to the arts and to the sciences. And our libraries are spectacular. The main reading room is truly a hybrid library where computers and digital data support non-digital data. We have specialized libraries such as the Tahsin Library for the Visually Impaired. We have Children's Library for the 5 to 11 year olds. We have a Young People's Library from the 11 to 16 year olds and multimedia and audiovisual library. We have a rare books library. We have also a microforms library, a map library, and we're proud to have a copy of the Internet Archive as a backup for the San Francisco original. Among the museums and galleries that we host and possess, we have four museums and 15 permanent exhibits. The Sadat Museum, to honor the late President Sadat, Nobel Peace Prize winner, and martyr to peace. A manuscript museum. An antiquities museum that covers examples from all the history of Egypt through donations from the various museums in Egypt. And a science museum combined with a planetarium and an exploratorium that uh, has an approach to tell young people how much their Muslim and Arab forebears as well as the ancient library of Alexandria as well as the ancient Egyptians contributed to the development of science. So that 50 centuries of science stands behind you as you young Egyptians try to make your own contributions. And we showed them spectacular films in the, in the planetarium and then at the Al Exploratorium, they get the chance for hands-on science to discover that the journey of discovery is what we really call science. We encourage them to ask what if and to experiment. And we hold an annual science festival. And what I'm happy in this picture to show you is the, the fun that the kids are having in that festival, which draws over 20,000 visitors every year. The permanent exhibitions are there in many different fields, provide beautiful art throughout the building in many different places. And as we go from one hall to the other, we are awed by the contributions of these great artists. We have four galleries that are used for temporary exhibitions so that we have constantly renewing our exposure to art from outside to science exhibits, to other exhibits, as well as giving chance for young and unknown artists to emerge. We have research institutes, and starting with a manuscripts institute, one that deals with calligraphy and writing, one that deals with special studies, documentation of heritage, which produced a patented system of presenting Egyptian heritage on multiple screens and computers, that is one of our centers located in Cairo. And we have the International School of Information Science, which is based on doing uh, our very high level computer work on uh, managing uh, library uh, information systems and other work of that kind. We have an art center that among other things created the first classical orchestra in Alexandria. And we have a center for the study of Alexandria and the Mediterranean and a center for Hellenistic studies that covers the period of the ancient library. And we have created a dialogue forum to discuss the problems with our societies and what we need to do to get things moving in the best possible way. It enabled us over the last 10 years to mobilize Egypt's intellectuals, produce publications, but above all, to engage with others. We have enormous digital resources. We've created archives for President Nasser, for President 
Sadat, for Butrus Butrus Gali, the Suez Canal Company, two and a half million documents. We've digitized over 180,000 books in Arabic. We've created special sites such as the Memory of Modern Egypt, which is kind of a world digital library in one language, it's a mini single language one. So the enormous analytical work which is presented at the library in various conferences or done at the library. From biorobotics to virtual reality to supercomputing. The digital future is indeed here and well at the library of Alexandria. There we are committed to provide access to all information for all people at all times. It's a goal that we intend to pursue. It's a goal that is compatible with this meeting. It is a goal that should be available to all people everywhere at all times. We are part of this formation of global knowledge that expands our brains reach and enables us to do what we couldn't do before. We can even imagine a day when we will use the new knowledge revolution and recognize knowledge not in the old librarian classifications, but in ways that reflect the reality of how knowledge is used, as these maps of interconnectedness show, or as this mapping by eigenfactor of how the social sciences are interconnected or undertake self-referencing, or how the natural sciences do it. And we can also imagine augmented reality and instant delivery of information to where it is needed, when it is needed. But the BA is also an activist organization. We handle outreach to universities, to school children where we send this book mobile, where we organize their art programs, or science fairs and science clubs in all the schools in Alexandria. We also organize science competitions throughout Egypt for people to bring out the best in their talents and their creativity. We provide programs to support young inventors and we need to provide even more knowledge to the public at large. And that is why we have our own TV studio from which I'm speaking at this moment. And we are organizing a local TV science series in both Arabic and English that deals with all facets of science for the public. But perhaps the BA's most important influence in our society has been to defend values to defend values by defending a vibrant civil society, to provide credible and recognized figures that drafted together at the library an important document in 2004 that was called Alexandria Declaration and moved us a great step forward. For we have used throughout these years the podium to uphold human rights and freedom of expression. We are proud to be associated with our Norwegian friends in what is known as the beacon for freedom of expression and to organize the Arab Reform Conferences from 2004 all the way up to the revolution. We organized every year a get together to call for the values of freedom of expression and democracy and we had many, many young people participate in that from plenary debates to audience participation, to internet participation on international fora that we helped create. All the parts that I described of this new type of institution are essential. They reinforce each other. And so these are our efforts to recapture the spirit of the ancient library of Alexandria. We are barely starting. We are not yet 10 years old. And we are rocked by a revolution and threatened by political currents of every stripe. But we are determined to succeed in our quest to honor the past, celebrate the present, and invent the future. Let me now turn to my third theme, 
the revolution in my country, Egypt. Revolutions unleash the best and the worst in the human spirit. And ours started with an exalting moment. It was at the outset of the Arab Spring, and ordinary citizens have toppled autocrats and still battle dictators armed with little more than their convictions. Ultimately, they cannot be denied. For as Victor Hugo said, no army can defeat an idea whose time has come. And freedom, human rights, and democracy are ideas whose time has come for even the most remote corners of the globe. Sparked by the successes of Tunisia and Egypt, the people speak. From the Syrian demonstrators to the chanting Yemeni crowds, they are the embodiment of the unconquerable spirit described by Henley's Invictus. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. This search for freedom, reminiscent of the best in human history, will face setbacks, to be sure. But ultimately, it must triumph. The Arab Spring and the Egyptian Revolution are well known. Everywhere, huge demonstrations held the public places in peaceful protest against the regime. Tahrir Square in Cairo became famous as the center of the vigils that in 18 days would topple Mubarak. Here is Tahrir Square empty. Here, when filled with demonstrators by day, by night, in peaceful prayer, in confrontation. The ultimate success of the peaceful Egyptian demonstrations were noticed the world over and had a surprising effect in Wisconsin, as these pictures attest. Everywhere in Egypt, the demonstrations were huge. And here is a demonstration on the Corniche of Alexandria, just west of the library. And that is the bottom red arrow in that diagram where I said the two streets where demonstrations went by next to the library. But in a magic, exalting moment, young people held hands even as they held up signs against Mubarak and his regime, they held hands to protect the library from any damage. They saw the library for what it was. They had no weapons except their beliefs. They held rolls of paper and the crowds responded. Not a stone was thrown at the library. And as I was to tell Nick Robertson of CNN, who was interviewing me, impressed by that event. Everyone we're seeing around us now, your staff coming back to work. Yes, pretty much, pretty much. That must feel quite good. Yes, Are you getting well, a sense of order back again? Uh, yeah, I hope so. I will speak to them, of course, like everybody else. They, they are citizens, they are different points of views. There are rumors around that I will speak to them about. See, even our coffee shop started operating. More than 2,000 workers. Everyone happy to be back. There must have been a moment when you were standing there. There was the, 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 the moment for you where you think, no, this could happen and they could come in. And then you saw it change. My confidence is there from, from the first day. We never built barriers. We never built walls. We never built gates that could be locked. The library is open. The doors of the library are in glass, as you saw on both sides. The, there's nothing that prevents anybody from destroying this building with all its treasures, except the will of the people. And in the end, that is the ultimate guarantor of everything, isn't it? They prayed in orderly fashions in front of the library, even as they destroyed the government building less than 10 blocks away for being a hated symbol of the old regime. They then created a huge flag in which they wrapped the library in recognition that it was a library for Egypt and for the world. That exalting moment 
which showed up with protections on both sides of the library, in fact, was captured in a beautiful little book for children. It was a truly exalting moment. And then the steps of the library became a favorite place for human rights demonstrations. Those who were worried about religious extremism, those who wanted freedom and human rights, all came there. And so eight years of hard work showed a clear contrast between how the young revolutionaries responded to the library and responded to government house a few blocks away. They even paid us a great homage by showing on this mural that they painted the three great pyramids and the fourth pyramid being the Library of Alexandria with both a mosque and a church coming out of the library. The young people of the 25th of January dedicated that mural to those who died in the revolution. But this exalting moment was not to last. Throughout Egypt, changes were taking place in the character of the revolution. Demonstrations were more likely to be about demands for employment and pay increases than demands for freedom and democracy. Gangs of thugs appeared in the streets, and some of the peaceful protests would turn into violent confrontations with authority. The library was not immune from these changes. The goodwill among the staff that was eager to return to open the library turned into protests that closed the library. Many forces were at work here. Contractual demands of some employees turned into a massive demonstration that turned into a full-scale confrontation with authority leading to manhandling me last October. The anger reached the level of attacks on the executive floor and physical threats to myself and my staff. But remaining true to the values of the BA and with a strong commitment to nonviolence, we confronted anger and distrust with rationality and civil discourse. And in a few weeks, where the library was closed, the library is now open and receiving and serving the public. Where the staff was demonstrating, we are back at work. And we avoided any violence. No police or army interventions, no wounded demonstrators, and not a stone thrown at the library. I am proud of our young staff for their commitment to the library and its mission. But that is not the same throughout Egypt. Sporadic violence erupted. The dead and wounded increased. Attacks on public buildings escalated, including the Institut d'Egypte, which was burned to the ground. The Institut, which was founded in 1798, lost all its collections of books and manuscripts, destroyed beyond the repair. Other public buildings were targeted. But today, thanks to the success of our quiet, nonviolent discussions, our staff are protecting the library along with its idealistic young users. And the library remains true to its mission to be a beacon of freedom, rationality, pluralism, and dialogue. All matters that were never more needed in Egypt than now. It is emblematic that the statue of Prometheus, who suffered for bringing fire to humanity, should be standing proudly in the plaza of the library, symbolizing how the library remains committed to its mission. But the building of the new Egypt is also underway. We had wonderful elections, and our new parliament was just seated in late January. Its two big blocks are religious-based parties, so it is no surprise to see that the library has been working with Sheikh al-Azhar, the highest religious authority in Egypt, to bring forward that great liberal and humanist Islamic tradition which allowed science to flourish throughout the Middle Ages when Europe was in the grip of bigotry and intolerance. Together, we addressed large audiences of religious scholars 
and helped issue the Al-Azhar Declaration and are in the process of reissuing the classics of that great humanist tradition. We all need to work together and support our elected parliament. Egypt needs to build its future, a new constitution, new laws, new ways of doing things. We need the wisdom to learn how to reinvent that past humane tradition to meet the needs of the 21st century. We need to learn how to fashion the wise constraints that make people free. Last year, at the National Academy of Sciences, I addressed the topic of science, values, and revolution. Let me return to it once more. Today, there are those who fear that the Arab Spring will give way to the Islamist winter, that the idealism of the revolutionary Democrats will only pave the way for theological autocrats. Yes, Islamist sentiment is rising and zealotry is expanding in parts of the public realm, but the defense against extremism is not by censorship or autocracy. It is by embracing pluralism and defeating ideas with ideas. And here, science has much to say. Science has much to say to the Islamic zealots who preach an intolerant doctrine. It has much to say to young Democrats enamored of the new technologies. It has much to say to those who yearn for a better economic future. And more importantly, it has much to say about the kind of values that we must adopt if our societies are to be truly open and democratic for these are the values of science. To the Islamists who yearn to return to their particular vision of the Muslim past, we say there is a great Muslim and Arab tradition of science and tolerance that you must be aware of. Indeed, throughout the Dark Ages, it was the Muslims who held up the torch of rationality and reason while Europe was in the throes of bigotry and intolerance. Centuries before Bacon, Descartes, and Galileo, Ibn al-Haytham, in the 10th century, laid down the rules of the empirical approach, describing how the scientific method should operate through observation, measurement, experiment, and conclusion. Hear his voice as he says, we start by observing reality. We then proceed by increasing our research and measurement, subjecting premises to criticism, and being cautious in drawing conclusions. In all we do, our purpose should be the search for truth, not the support of opinions. Likewise, listen to the voice of Ibn al-Nafis in the 13th century on accepting the contrarian view subject only to the test of evidence and rational analysis. When hearing something unusual, do not preemptively reject it, for that would be folly. Indeed, horrible things may be true, and familiar and praised things may prove to be lies. This is the Muslim tradition that must be revived if the Arab world, Muslim and non-Muslim alike, will indeed join the ranks of the advanced societies of our time. Rejecting politicized religiosity, and reviving these traditions would promote the values of science in our societies. To the youth enamored with new technologies or simply seeking a better economic future, we say, remember science and the scientific method, for it is scientific insight and knowledge that gives birth to technology. We must be the producers of knowledge, not just the consumers of technology. And that will not happen unless we open our minds to science and the scientific approach and open our hearts to the values of science. Now, what are these values of science that I keep returning to as the basis for enhancing human capabilities and ensuring the public welfare? As Bronowski observed more than half a century ago, the enterprise of science requires the adoption of certain values, truth, honor, teamwork, constructive subversiveness, engagement with the other, freedom, imagination, and a method for the arbitration of disputes. The values of science are adhered to by its practitioners 
with a rigor that shames other professions. Truth, any scientist who manufactures his data is ostracized forever from the scientific community. She or he may err in interpreting the data, but no one can accept fabrication of data. In no other field of human activity is this commitment to truth so absolute. Honor. Scientists reject plagiarism. To give each his or her due is essential, a sentiment well captured in Newton's statement that if I have seen farther than most, it is because I have stood on the shoulders of giants. Teamwork has become essential in most fields of science. And the essence of teamwork is to ensure that all the members of the team receive the recognition that they deserve. Science advances by overthrowing the existing paradigm or at least significantly expanding or modifying it. Thus, there is a certain constructive subversiveness built into the scientific enterprise as a new generation of scientists makes its own contribution. And so it must be. Without that, there would be no scientific advance. But our respect and admiration for Newton is not diminished by the contributions of Einstein. We can and do admire both. And this constant renewal and advancement of our scientific understanding is a feature of the scientific enterprise. It requires tolerant engagement with the contrarian view, as Ibn Nafis said so many centuries ago, accepting to arbitrate disputes by the rules of evidence and rationality. And science requires freedom, freedom to inquire, to challenge, to think, to imagine the unimagined. It cannot function within the arbitrary limits of convention, nor can it flourish if it is forced to shy away from challenging the accepted. The content of scientific work is what is discussed, not the person who produced it, regardless of their nationality or the color of their skin or the god they choose to worship or the ethnic group they were born into or their gender. These are societal values worth defending, not just to promote the pursuit of science, but to have a better and more humane society. These are the central core of universal values that any truly modern society must possess. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, I was unable to join you today because I stayed in Egypt to do battle for those values of science, to protect our Bibliotheca Alexandrina, and to defend our societies against the forces of obscurantism, fanaticism, and xenophobia. My youthful colleagues and I, committed to the values of science and armed with revolutionary ardor, join hands with you, the builders of the global knowledge society of tomorrow. Let us build that world of science and understanding, that world where in the immortal words of Tagore, where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken into fragments by narrow domestic walls, where words come from the depths of truth, where tireless striving stretches its arms towards perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the desert sand of dead habit, where the mind is led by thee into ever widening thought and action and into that heaven of freedom, my father, let my country awake. Thank you.